much, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, great meeting, and congrats with the anniversary. So I'm, uh, just to disclose, my full-time job is epidemiologist like Leah, and we had a lot of nice uh, collaborations over the years. I work in Copenhagen, lead a smaller group on environmental epidemiology, and what I'll present today is my free-time job on translating policy, and this is maybe one of the problems why we don't translate well enough this huge amount of evidence that we have. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more in my role as a chair of the European Respiratory Society Environment and Health Committee and my involvement with ISC. I believe everybody knows here, but maybe I'm assuming that this is International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, the home of environmental epidemiologists globally, uh, where I'm also a member of Council, Policy Committee, and uh, European chapter. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit most about that work because that's where uh, this knowledge and experience I want to share. Uh, what do we focus on? I'll focus on several topics where we try to make impact and communicate about air pollution and make indirect impact or direct impact of policy. COVID air pollution mentioned by Clea. Air pollution, all our work has been around revision of EU ambient air quality directive. I, I assume you're aware, although you're not in EU, that there's a major policy change in EU ongoing on air pollution, so this is mostly what we worked on right now. And also climate change and why we want to bring climate change and air pollution closer together, not to have them in these silos. And I'll have some concluding remarks. Just briefly to tell you what, what, who we are, uh, European Respiratory Society is a very important ally in communicating about air pollution risk. Uh, to respiratory patients, which arguably are some of the most affected, and that's where R R Rosamond is sitting here. It's a society with more than 35,000 uh, members, clinicians, healthcare workers, scientists working on respiratory health, trying to improve uh, health for respiratory patients. This is the globally largest society, bigger than American, American Thoracic Society, so, so, uh, which has very uh, good tradition working with advocacy on uh, cleaner, better health uh, for lungs, where part of that is environment and health committee that has been uh, led by a lot of our members, uh, Francesco early and Bert from ISCE, and right now we are the, the members of this uh, committee. And here we strategically work in the committee uh, to promote uh, and advocate for environmental health, for cleaner air, uh, uh, to protect human health, um, uh, so directly, if, if you don't know. And here we draw very much an expertise on the office. Uh, Brian Ward, it's a full-time position, Director of Advocacy European Affairs, who has insight in political process and, and secretarial help. Uh, so, so there's a lot of help coming to us uh, uh, from them. So air pollution and COVID, I'll start with this. In, in my term, now third year as in, a, in this committee, of course, uh, with the COVID pandemic, we saw an opportunity uh, because pandemic has raised interest in air pollution because we've seen reductions in air pollutions around the globe and because of poor but early studies that showed some correlations between high levels of air pollution in Italy and where the outbreak happened. So the big question on everybody's lips was, do particles trans transmit the virus uh, not whether air pollution increases risk of us contracting the virus and uh, dying or, or being hospitalized, which studies, as Claire showed, uh, now show us. So we organized the webinar. So this is a way to be proactive, to put this on agenda. We did it together with European Parliament. Uh, we invited Jutta Paulus, who is an MEP in the Parliament, to co-host the meeting. This was in, during the in midst of the pandemic in, the, uh, in the, uh, December. And we invited a number of experts to talk about transmission of the particles, also about early evidence on, on, from research. There was very few stu good studies at that point uh, to see whether air pollution is a risk factor and to discuss this in a bigger framework of planetary health and cl climate change, um, uh, the, the whole issue, and, and had debate with some of our experts here and European commissioner uh, uh, as well. Uh, we have also wrote a kind of workshop report where we stated some of our points that, that for COVID pandemic uh, uh, policies or dealing with COVID pandemic should have air pollution in the heart of it because of this likely association with air pollution. Um, and, and I think that still holds nicely today. Uh, we also co-hosted some webinars. We have been keeping uh, uh, also uh, eye on what's going on with evidence coming out. And we are also now in the, now that we have actually enough evidence, as Claire pointed out, a lot of good studies have come out in the last three years. And we are trying to put, another way we put topics on agenda, of course, for European Respiratory Society lung, and lung health professionals, COVID is a very important topic. So we're trying to put through conference, uh, annual conference, and now in Milano, 
uh, a whole webinar, uh, seminar, sorry, symposium, which will follow up a couple of activities, probably new statement and so on. So this is one way to say in the COVID pandemic um, strategies, we need to really be aware of air pollution. Uh, uh, the next big uh, topic uh, really is the revision of EU uh, ambient uh, air quality directive, AAQD. Uh, I hope you're all aware this has been ongoing and this is something that is really taking most of our time. So the WHO uh, global air quality guidelines were published in September, uh, sorry, October 21. Uh, they have been, uh, uh, EU uses HO gui global guidelines as their synthesis of evidence on health effects of air pollution. Uh, and they have started the whole process of revision of European law on air pollution the day of the uh, publishing of these guidelines. And this kind of kick-started our work on, on, on these guidelines, on, the, uh, on uh, making an impact, translating knowledge uh, to the directive. Uh, this is a, a graph of the clear air milestones, so the old uh, processes in the, the revision of the directive, and I'm not gonna go in detail, but just to see there's so many things here where you, we were able to make impact, and I'll show some of the things we did and so on. Uh, and we do this in collaboration, of course, with Brussels office. It's, it's, it's really a daunting task, uh, but everything starts around here. So I'll lead you to some examples of what we have done and how we, how we can get engaged. And maybe I'll end up recruiting some of you, as Virginia did, uh, be aware. Uh, so we organized again a webinar on the day of the release, the half hour after WHO's own webinar on the uh, release of WHO guidelines. We invited our own experts to comment together with Maria on the uh, uh, importance of this uh, uh, for uh, AQD. Uh, and again, we published a statement. We were ready, we, we got information leaked, so we really on the day have already published the tutorial where we expressed our position. This is position of European Respiratory Society that we stand in for full alignment of air quality standards with WHO guidelines. So we're saying, and this is our position, it's clear, if new air quality directive, if new EU laws are going to uh, uh, be uh, designed to protect health, the only reasonable thing uh, to do is to follow evidence on the health. That, that's our position, it's clear, and, and we go for full alignment. In this type of statements, we also provide some evidence, some review for respiratory clinicians and beyond on health effects of air pollution. We give a brief overview why is air pollution so important for lung health and educate a little bit about directive. This is the ongoing EU, uh, the current limit values there from 2008 and, and exposing this gap between evidence and the current EU laws. Uh, we also engage a number of other health uh, uh, societies. Uh, as Claire mentioned, beyond lung, now we have overwhelming evidence in the last couple of decades on heart and cancer and brain and, and beyond in children. And, uh, so we, we, one of our strategies is to engage more health communities. This is really a health issue, not an, an, it, environment is not relevant if it's not talking about our health, humans in the center. And we have uh, engaged over 160 small and large world, globally, societies, uh, uh, patient, uh, medical associations, and have these joint statements also to express the full endorsement uh, of WHO guidelines, health evidence for designing new laws. Uh, so this, this is kind of, we, so we expressed our position early on that we had a number of opportunities to uh, go in more details. Uh, European Commission, uh, the one who was going to propose, propose a new law has uh, organized and kick-started a number of public consultations of air pollution. This is really for all citizens of EU. You can, as a private person or organization, go in, follow the meeting. This is for written responses, meetings where one could register and follow, uh, where we, of course, were present and, and, again, restated our position for full alignment. Uh, we have also, uh, our position is very much enrolled to push the new evidence. <laughs> a lot of new evidence has been published since WHO guideline. Uh, WHO guidelines reviewed evidence up to 2018. Since 18, we have a lot of new studies and a lot of our work has been to communicate that the evidence after WHO uh, guidelines support this. And of course, Claire already nicely introduced, a lab study has been crucial really. It, the study has been designed exactly to see whether we still have health effects at the low levels that we have today, which are be way below our current laws. So, for us, it's a, it's a pity that such a study, results of such a study that were, came out after 2018 are not used in air pollution, in designing new laws uh, for air pollution in Europe. 
So we have organized this webinar together with HCI uh, to, to bring it closer to European reality and European uh, uh, policy makers. And again, we invite uh, European commissioners to uh, the webinar to comment on the results and uh, ask them uh, directly how are they gonna use it in designing new policies. Uh, we have also participated in the EU Clean Air Forum, Francesco and I were there. And again, here you get two minutes to say why this is important for the policy. So what the, the reasons why we uh, uh, endorse full alignment uh, or guidelines to new policy. So just some example and to answer some of your questions, how we communicate, we stress that the point that everybody's exposed, which is also the main points of the guideline now with these low levels, this is a health risk factor that everybody's exposed to. To us, that, uh, that, that's a really important issue here. <coughs> that health burden is huge and unacceptable, and uh, of course we count deaths, but there are so many diseases, so many outcomes, uh, more uh, smaller and bigger outcomes that we study that we don't study so well as sick days and so on. This is unacceptable, and of course, to stress that this is really a public health, planetary health opportunity, this air pollution law, to protect health, to prevent a significant number of new diseases. And also, we're bringing the co-benefit of climate change crisis mitigation, which I think is important for policymakers. Uh, another example is that we, get, we, we made a direct intervention, uh, a part of European Commission's uh, process in designing a new proposal for a new law is to make their own health impact assessment. So they count, based on newest evidence, how many deaths are attributable to air pollution and make cost-benefit analysis, which is important for their considerations. They were going to do that uh, based on this meta-analysis that was done for uh, WHO guidelines, and, and that is a very good approach. I, don't, I think Claire mentioned this was the review of the all studies on long-term exposure of air pollution mortality. That brought up um, a new evidence that air pollution health effects now are stronger than we previously knew. Not to go in details, but this 8% of uh, increase in premature mortality for each 10 increase in PM2.5 is now bigger than what we knew before from the earlier meta-analysis that were used for this health impact assessment of 1.06. So that's one of the major points of the guidelines. Uh, the commission was going to use that estimate, which, which is a fine approach, but we expressed, again, directly, we wrote a letter to commissioners uh, to say that we have now a lab study, and the point that the lab study finds much larger effect estimates than the global review of evidence of all air pollution studies up until 2018. And we just wanted to express that we would like them to consider including the newest evidence um, and, and provide its example how to do it. Uh, we got in this nice conversation, commissioners answered back to us, wrote a letter, we organized a meeting on 5th of July, uh, and proposed, uh, and then, yeah, with Francesco and colleagues, we made a meta-analysis, we have two studies, two estimates, we simply meta-analyzed them and provided a new uh, uh, estimate of 1.12, so just, just the details of how we went. We also provided a quick review of the newest studies, European studies that came out after WHO guidelines. They all point out in stronger effects than what WHO guidelines show. So we believe that for, for European realities, we should consider this newer evidence. That this seems really to tell us that WHO guideline underestimates the real burden of air pollution in Europe. Uh, we did that for PM2.5 and for NO2. And again, they needed this published somewhere they can refer to it. So we quickly wrote an editorial uh, and published this. And they actually took this as a sensitivity analysis. Uh, it's maybe hard to find in there. Uh, papers, but they took it, and European environmental agencies also took this proposal to, as a sensitivity analysis in their health impact assessment. So that's a little success, maybe, in uh, getting them to imp uh, implement new evidence. Uh, so uh, proposal came out then. Uh, commission has worked on proposal. That was published in October 26 to 22. So now, now next part of the work is after a uh, uh, new proposal for the law has published is to kind of react on this. And I, don't, I guess you have all, most of you know, but uh, gui guideline values, let's focus on PM2.5 and NO2, or they recommend five and 10. Uh, the proposal fails short on full alignment. Uh, it goes, proposes new laws to be 10 for PM2.5 and 20. This is still much better than what we have now, but not fully what we hoped for. So we uh, have responded right away that uh, 
yeah, we, we are slightly disappointed, but of course welcome the right uh, step in the right direction. Uh, and we also in uh, published, uh, again, editorial where we go a little bit more details. It's not just about alignment and the timeline. Uh, that's also another way to delay this, to say whether it's 20, 30 or 50. Uh, so we expressed also some other points from this proposal on ozone, a number of things. I don't have time to go in detail, but we can read on them in this uh, proposal, our position on all of these issues in the proposal that we, we have opinion about. Um, I just want to point out that we have a really strong collaboration with uh, NGO HEAL. If you don't know what HEAL is, it's a Health and Environment Alliance, an NGO in Brussels. They have full employed employees who help us uh, to react, to, to write, uh, to commission, and to get the right timing. Uh, another thing we did with them, we submitted amendments to the proposal. There was a window of a couple of weeks when everybody could su submit amendments. We did that but very much together with HEAL and other health groups that we work together. I'll show it in a slide. Because just the whole daunting work in reading the proposal, how you put in amendments, I, I would not in my capacity be able to do this by myself. Um, so, so this collaboration has been crucial uh, with HEAL. Uh, HEAL is uh, organized the health groups that we are part of from European Rescue Society, from ISE. Uh, we feed the evidence, so we're important partners in, in their work in, in, on air quality, um, on, on advocating for clean air. They also have a number of important health groups, uh, uh, Allergy Association, uh, European Association of Doctors, European Association of Health Insurers. Uh, and the way HEAL works, they, they organize meetings from us, uh, for us with EU Commissioner Sinkovicius. This was while the Commission was preparing proposal. With MEP in Parliament, now Parliament is uh, um, looking into proposal and it's going to vote soon. Uh, the, the local meetings in Germany, this is Barbara there. So, so HEAL is really crucial in this work and they use us as experts to react and, and uh, get us involved uh, because we are important translators of the knowledge that we produce. And, and we're also closely collaborating with HEI, of course, in a lot of these activities. Uh, HEAL is also helping train our members, ICE, in how to get more engaged, how to respond to policy, how to do more activities in our home countries. Um, and uh, we are very grateful to that collaboration. I really couldn't do it without it. Uh, sometimes uh, MEPs from the parliament organize meetings about air pollution, invite us as experts to come in and talk. That's, that's one way they, they put air pollution on agenda. This was a meeting in November. Uh, also, Javi Lopez, uh, this was a public hearing on the proposal uh, where we also were invited to, uh, and, again, and again, we state our position for full alignment. Uh, that, that, that's our job in these meetings. Uh, and another mechanism is that we organize the meetings and we invite uh, politicians to listen. And one of the latest meetings we, we did this uh, on was two weeks ago in, on uh, May 24th in Brussels. Many of you were there and contributed, where we made, make a, made a meeting, hold a meeting with purpose to feed the newest evidence and very much to update what's happened since WHO guidelines and to restate that uh, evidence of health effects on air pollution is overwhelming and we have more than enough to act now uh, and to, for full alignment. Um, uh, and uh, one of the important things in this meeting that we also engaged some new partners, new health organizations as Cardiology Society and Cancer Society, which were not part of these health groups that we, we work with in air pollution advocacy so far. Uh, so where are we now? Uh, right now, uh, this is Parliament is voting in early July. Um, so right now, our job is really after Parliament vote, which we really hope the Parliament would approve current proposal. It's not given. Uh, so we are really contacting MEPs very much with help with Hill, who, who identifies names and sends us emails and asks us for different countries, in, if possible, in our own language, um, uh, to contact MEPs. I organize a meeting, tell them again and again about importance for health and this issue, uh, not assuming they maybe they know uh, all of it. Uh, some that are likely to vote for, some that are against, some that are we hope we can affect. We're not sure how they're going to vote. Some of the people from Hill will go to, to Strasbourg at their vote and, and catch people on the hallways. Is that, is that that amount of work uh, uh, to try to affect them in, in the right direction, uh, we hope, uh, to vote for uh, cleaner air uh, advocacy. Uh, Parliament vote after that, if that passes, then the council is uh, uh, going to uh, deal with this and that there's a whole new activities we're gonna work with health ministers and so on. 
Uh, another thing uh, is be beside this law, there's many other laws indirectly and directly that affect air pollution. Euro 7, of course, is uh, something we have been following, writing uh, editorials uh, reacted to lack of ambition uh, that we would hope, um, so that's also something we follow. We have also made joint statements uh, to react to something like uh, happening new coal mines opening uh, here in UK. Some of the members from IC that are UK based have engaged us and wrote a really nice response to express concern about that and yeah, just, just to give some example how we do this. Uh, and another, I will end with the climate change uh, uh, issue. We are also writing a uh, number of statements on climate change. Uh, and um, this is an important topic, of course, and uh, which something that we really want to build in in our committee is to have climate change and air pollution as a single issue, not a separate issue. Uh, there's a number of... Uh, uh, from the sources, from impact on health, we clearly see that these two, two, two solutions and policies, of course, that this should be talked more as a single issue. This is actually something that air quality guidelines bring forward. It's not something we talk so much, but this is their own uh, uh, slide or graph uh, that, of course, uh, reducing air pollution and mitigating climate change together uh, is needed to protect our health. So we bring that forward. Uh, this is about to, to publish our official statement. We also wrote a statement in educating uh, ERS uh, members in their journal that is more about educating clinicians. Uh, and we had one of, actually ERS had actually a climate change statement. This is Francesco's work numbers of years ago. So uh, again, ERS has been really forward uh, and early on uh, in, in advocacy on climate change as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I know some other activities very much for us is important to educate the clinicians. Uh, we think this is a very important step. Of course, talking to directly to politicians is one way to impact policy. Uh, the, some things that I've, I've learned through this person that resonate that no matter uh, how much we talk to politicians, a lot of them know this already. The ones that are engaged in the topic usually know it. Uh, and you feel sometimes you're talking to people that already know it or are we spending our time in the right way. Uh, educating clinicians uh, is crucial to us because, and educating the public because politicians are still not going to do anything if it's unpopular. And I think one way to educate the public is through educating clinicians and patients and patients groups. Uh, so this is something we really are passionate about it in ERS. And we do this a lot through ERS Congress every year. Uh, there's air pollution is always on the agenda, but we try to increase this and put forward a number of symposium and, and hot topics and so on. Last year we had this hot topic about uh, climate change relevance to uh, politicians. And this year we are in Milano where um, I think Francesco can talk more about it in a region where now there's a big uh, opposition to current proposal in EU and Francesco spends a lot of his free time to fight with those interesting guys. So we will really use focus on having the health conference uh, in Milano to talk about air quality directive proposal, air pollution and health, climate change and health and, and put a number of topics forward uh, here in Italy uh, in a health conference. Uh, we also have other opportunities. ERS has a number of educational uh, possibilities, something ERS satellites once a year that put focus on many, a number of topics. The thousands of physicians join actually listen to these educational events where, again, we had opportunity to talk about environment and climate change uh, and, and respiratory health last year. So this is another forum we can indirectly talk about these issues. Uh, uh, another statement ERS has prepared uh, last year was on asthma patient and environment or, or, or this um, dilemma of asthmatics using medication that uh, releases F gases, which are greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, and, and the need for right treatment and asthma patients being affected by climate change and air pollution and how, how do you navigate in that? Quite interesting and not difficult topic, but we also get, had a webinar about it where it was also opportunity to talk about impact of air pollution on asthma. Uh, we also do a lot of work in Eastern Europe. It's a strategic area, of course. Air pollution here is the highest and a lot of these countries are not going to be easy to con uh, convince in, in the council uh, negotiations to support the new air pollution law. So we do a number of training. This was just before uh, COVID. We did a session in Poland. Uh, we have now a lot of focus on Southeastern Europe and there was a webinar organized together with HEI and HEAL um, and ISC in, in Western uh, Balkan countries, in Serbia and Bulgaria and engaging these countries in educating on air pollution. 
Uh, and now some concluding remarks. Uh, so we uh, really, uh, as I see as epidemiologists, I think what, what also resonated with me with some of these meetings in parliament that commissioners and those MEPs, they come to us say, well, you have such enormous evidence. To, to, they work on a number of other files, if it's a new laws on chemicals or so on. They've never, it's such an easy case for them because evidence is so overwhelming. Uh, where it makes me wonder why have we been so bad to translate that in action if you have such a good evidence uh, with so many diseases. And I think one of the things that uh, I personally, uh, also in Ella's case, that resonates with me that no health professional uh, uh, dealing with Ella, and I think we're still here uh, at, at a confer medical conference that we go, that a lot of clinicians still don't know about air pollution health impacts. They don't have it in their medical curriculums. They wouldn't know how to talk to their patients about it. That we, we really see an opportunity and, and something that, that we really need to be better at to mitigate effects on the patients in the meantime while we get better laws and so on. So our, uh, we really need to work more with medical societies, the memberships of European Society of Cardiology, uh, European Cancer Organization, and we, we will build stronger alliances with ERS to work in future with them and put uh, things on, on agenda uh, for their members and patients and, and re related people. Uh, so conclusions, uh, so how to translate evidence, and I, of course talking directly for politicians, and this is an example of what we do now with AQD, is a way to go. Uh, and, and stating, again, clear, short messages, uh, supporting, it's all evidence-based uh, for us, that's very important, but also pointed out to co-benefits and, and interactions with, with climate change agenda, with physical activity agenda. I think this was also brought up briefly yesterday. Uh, a lot of this air pollution uh, and promote, policies, promotion of active travel will do major things for physical activity agenda. And so these co-benefits interactions are really important. Uh, working with NGOs, other uh, partners is very uh, important and we don't have competence alone to, to work uh, and talk directly to politicians. Uh, and indirect impact, I think still what we're not that good is this information to public, uh, information to clinicians, patients. I think we fail there. We still, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of um, physicians working with diseases that are clearly related to air pollution don't know about it, haven't heard about it. So I think we need to really uh, both empower public on in environment and health. I'm not sure how to do that. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have the, the right toolbox. Uh, but we need to work more with mainstream media to really share our results broader. And I know Gary is doing great work here, uh, but we need more of that. Uh, working with medical societies, we need to educate doctors, patients, to empower them. Doctors are great uh, multipliers of message. They, they carry a lot of respect with their patients. Uh, uh, but we need to also get a little bit out of speaking to each other that know about this, but go to medical conference and speak more about our results on our research uh, to put it on agenda for medical conference. Nobody's gonna do it if we don't do it. Uh, working with patient societies, I think what uh, was mentioned yesterday by Mayor Ken, humanizing the stories resonate better with physicians, with general public. The, the number statistics are something we like in epidemiology. But patient story, of course, has much more impact and is more relatable to, to, to people. Uh, of course, they support each other, but, but these stories are extremely important to bring forward and bringing patients to our meetings, we're doing that more and more um, uh, in their experience. And building alliances, of course, a lot of this work, as I mentioned, we did as a health group. It's very important that we don't go alone, three, four different societies with the politicians with respect to their time and, and the resonance of our messages, we're stronger if we make a joint voice with other medical societies and have a clear short messages uh, and whatever numbers we use or language so, so the messages are clear and repetitive um, and persuasive, hopefully. So that's all and I just wanna thank some, some uh, partners in crime. A lot of this work is together with H.I. and Hannah and Barbara, Brian and a couple of others from IC that have been crucial in it. Thank you. <laughs> Allow two questions again before coffee. Anybody want to take? Yes, we've got one at the back, please. Hi, Sarana. Andrea from Client Earth. I know that you do a lot of work as well with colleagues in Brussels, so thank you for all so much for um, the way that you mobilise the health sector um, across Europe. Um, I'm just wondering whether the was any further reflections? You mentioned a little bit about how maybe you think about the way that you communicate when you're speaking directly to politicians, um, the, the sort of things that you have in mind. And I wonder if you could just give a little bit more detail or thoughts of how maybe you f approach 
uh, talking to a politician and, and talking about those health impacts that you might do differently if you were, in, for example, in this sort of environment with academics or with health professionals. Um, you know, I guess the previous speaker talked about um, scientists being very comfortable with levels of uncertainty, um, but just wondering whether you could just uh, maybe share a little bit of insight of maybe what you've learned in dealing with politicians about how best to communicate these sort of messages to them. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I'll re disclose I was really poor and I thought I was good giving speeches and conferences, but it's a whole different uh, name of the game. Usually in all our meetings, we have two to four to five minutes, slides, maybe no slides, so you really have to cut it down to three, four more main messages. So keeping it short and clear, and again, working with Hill has been really impeccable for us to say. Um, and not to give any uh, doubt or any insecurity or that we need, we have, a, we have gaps in knowledge and all that we'd like to hear. And we have amount, incredibly a lot of knowledge and really this is also the politicians fed back. It's amazing how much knowledge we have. <laughs> in a lot of other cases, this would have passed the laws and so on. So really keeping it short and clear uh, and something like a full alignment and acceptable health cost of inaction already to us. Everybody is exposed, really something that Maria and Era is really good at. Nobody should die from breathing in Europe, nobody should get sick. So those are things that politicians like to hear, maybe a few cases, a uh, few faces, unfortunately, of, of people that have died prematurely rather than 7 million, 300 million, that 300, that the, the numbers and relative risks are not something that politicians respond to, but just kind of, and, and re repeating the message really. And, and, and I, something I want to bring up, I, I don't know if it will be impactful or not, does this matter or not, but measuring impact of our work, that's, I think we've discussed a lot of here, we, we, we hope we'll be able to celebrate in a year from now that we have a new strict law, but those are just some short points from me. Thank you. Do you have a second question? If not, I'll fill in with one, Joanna. Sure. Is there Rosamund. anything, is there anything in, sorry, did I miss somebody else? Rosamond. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's come to Rosamond. We'll leave my question for later. I want to speak to you about COVID and ask you, I wasn't sure why people were surprised when ethnic minorities, so black and brown people, were four times more likely to die than because they are exposed already. I spoke to Stephen about this in quite a lot of detail, mm -hmm. that they are more exposed to air pollution. Um, what I struggle with we come, when it comes to politicians, they know the evidence because you've given the evidence to them. And I don't know whether you know where we are in the UK. Um, WHO guidelines 2021 is not even a thing the government want to talk about. They're talking about implementing the 2005 ones in 17 years time. And I wonder what more needs to happen for governments to actually move. I don't think it's a case of, so when I talk to them, they already know the evidence. People think they don't know, but they do. So is it a question of money, popularity, votes? What's your, what, what, what's your guess? And apart from taking them to court, is there anything else you can suggest? Well, thanks for posing really good question. I struggled myself with that. I feel we have such enormous evidence. Why haven't been able to translate it? better and more uh, in, in, in policy so far. I guess question lies in who are the people against the proposal, and, and we got a little insight, of course, to people that, there are arguments about, uh, I think Francesco and I <laughs> have a lot of fun uh, with arguments that come out, economic collapse, that cleaning air pollution will leave our economies, and we'll lose jobs and so on. Uh, the, the, the intricate ways, the car industry, oil industry, we don't even know. Um, it, it, and I wonder sometimes when we talk to politicians, they, they, the ones we talk to, they know about this. They sit there meeting, they're busy, they have half hour for us and they go on. And, and I wonder with Hill, why do, do, do we waste time to start telling the same thing again and again? I fly from Copenhagen, I fly home. But I say, if we're not there, somebody else will take that time and we'll talk against the strict law. So it's just, uh, so I, I, I guess, the opposition has been more successful, but I, I don't know. I don't have better s solution, uh, really. I, I don't know if I have a better answer. But I think what we get more and more that we really need to make public more aware somehow. I don't know whether imperial revolution or whatever Maria says, and why we're not able to communicate that better. That's, uh, that I think we all have work to do. Lovely. I don't know if it's going to be into your coffee break. Go on then. I'm happy one, to. one more, and then we'll have, we'll, we, we, we really will call it a day. So let's set that question there, please, if we can. Uh, 
Um, so our politicians are really engaged. I mean, we're a local authority and, you know, we're a small area. I've been thinking about um, uh, Rosamond's question as well. It's almost how people, a bit like anti-vax, how people react to something that's factual and fear-based uh -huh. and then a narrative of don't worry about it is going to go away. I think some of it is the impact on business, but it's almost how do we counteract the don't worry if we hide it will go away with something that's also hopeful, which is... Yes, there's something scary over here, but look at the things we can do on the ground to counteract that. Because otherwise it's, and I don't, you know, we're struggling with it locally. Otherwise it's, here's something really scary. Um, and then the opposition are saying, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. It doesn't really cause deaths. So it's, can we use your science and all that fantastic research you're doing to say, here's something that's happening, but here are the solutions. Be with us on that journey. But I don't know, we haven't cracked it, but we're lucky that um, our politicians are on board locally. But yeah, very interested in continuing to work with Frank and Ben on this translational winning hearts and minds kind of thing. But thank you. Thank you. Maybe just a quick comment. We're working now more with sociologists and environments to, to try to understand what are the drivers of change? What do public what does public respond with, which information, and how, what are they like to uptake? So we worked with one for Poland who identified women, mothers, as really receptive. They know, they can feel when the air is a little bit more smoggy and they don't take their kids to bed. So I think we need to do more work in what makes impact, what, how to take our messages to wider public, who responds to them. Um, I, I, we definitely need to, to have respect that we're not that good at it. We need to do more work uh, to communicate. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to share an insight on how, how to be better at it. Because I think a necessary step in convincing politicians is definitely convincing public. And also keeping positive message. And to Maria, a lot of it. This is an opportunity. We have already, what in Denmark we talk now, it, it's the same. Well, we already achieved reductions. Come on, there is no problem. The clear air is clean. In Copenhagen, it's hardly ever smoggy. And, people cycle around, uh, but just to say we already achieved so much, Denmark is leading an example with our cycling rates. A little push more, we still have Altifex, let's, we know what to do, we just need to do a little bit more of it. We try to keep it, and then we'll get even nicer cities, even greener, even more cycle paths, we'll all benefit. Maybe switching into opportunity and positive message would work, but I'm not, that's just intuition. I, I hopefully we'll be better at it together. Lovely, we must move on now. Thank you, Zorana, for Thank such you. an informative talk. <laughs>